Now we go forward to the revolutionary period. This one you know better. So I don't have to do as much of a run through, although we're good for a time. England and France fought a hundred years war, you know that very famously. I like to say to my students, there's a second hundred years war that begins with the coming of Louis XIV to the throne in the late 1600s. And through all the 1700s, England and France are engaged in a kind of competition as to who's going to be the dominant power. England wins. And that final battle happens, using the American name for that battle, with the French and Indian War. At the end of the French and Indian War, France is pushed to second place. Within 20 years, she will go through her own revolution. There'll be a whole new series of wars that kind of roll in. You can include it in the Second Hundred Years War if you want to. I typically don't because the Napoleonic Wars are really a newer thing that's happening. So England wins. Yay! Once again, we would imagine everybody would be happy, but they weren't happy. Mostly they weren't happy because England was massively in debt. Their debt crisis was extraordinary. And the government has to try to solve this problem. But they don't do this well. Once again, there's poor leadership involved. England will go through a pillar period of time where over seven years they have five prime ministers. Now if you know anything about sports, you know how this is bad. Right? Poor Orlando City, who I support, Five years, three head coaches. The winner, they're not very good. The Dolphins are going through the same thing right now. They're on, like, what, fourth head coach in, like, six or seven years. I'm a huge Dolphin fan from way back in the 70s when I used to follow him as a kid. You know, give me Greasy. Right? Give me give me Shula again for 30 years, right? Meanwhile, compared to the Pittsburgh Steelers, they've had, like, three head coaches in 50 years. Right? Why are they always one of the best teams? Belichick's been the, been the coach for New England for, what, 20 years now. Why are they the best teams? Stability through leadership. Now, it helps if the person's good, like Belichick. But nonetheless, I think I'd be re you'd be happier, actually better off if you had a mediocre coach, but you had him for seven or eight or nine years because consistency is huge. Five prime ministers of seven years, they're kind of all over the place in decision making. They made one bad decision after another to solve one critical crisis. The debt was a crisis. They had to solve it. They were trying to figure out how do they solve it. And so whether they got there or not, I don't know. Well, they didn't get there, basically. And they overreached with a thing called the Stamp Act. The Stamp Act is basically like an income tax. Which today, you or I, we have income taxes. We have sales tax, I should say. What sales tax? Go to the store, you pick up your $15 blouse, you go to the, the person, you give them $16.20. You never argue the point. You never, I have, how dare you? The tax is 15 Because you just go, sales tax, I get it. But you can imagine, if sales tax did not exist somewhere, and then all of a sudden some leader brought it in the next day, people might be pretty frustrated. No, the tax is 15. Why are you asking me for 16, 20? Well, I'm not going to pay that. Well, then you can't have the shirt. Well, I can't believe this. Where's our manager? Right? Because they wouldn't know to expect that. The Americans, the British colonists in the New World, had never had the stamp act, had never had stamp taxing before. They were furious. And this actually exploded up on the British leadership because um, the, the Americans would begin to rally, both in the streets and new political voices. This ultimately will lead to a showdown with the parliament over who's in charge. And even though the parliament will back down with the Stamp Act, they'll then, with the new prime minister, roll the dice again in a far worse way with a thing called the Townsend Acts, which provokes the Boston Massacre. Again, it's not really a massacre, but still, blood in the streets. British, our soldiers, shooting civilians in the street. If you say it like that, you're like, well, that's terrible. I mean, terrible, right? Something's gone wrong. They attempt to solve things with the last of those five prime ministers, who's actually pretty good. And he tried to do nothing for three years. But then in an unexpected turn of events, he tried to help the Americans out, as well as the East Indian Trading Company, by lowering the tax on tea. Which, of course, the Americans were so happy, they went and threw all the tea into the harbor. Because if they accepted the lower tax, they were accepting the leadership of part. And this philosophical divide had become so deep by 1773, Sam Adams is basically over my dead body. Just in case you're not clear, they threw literally millions and millions of dollars of tea. It wasn't just a few crates that were like $25 of Lipton. What they threw away was, I mean, and this we don't usually get, an attack on the king's property is an attack on the king's person himself. So not surprisingly, Parliament responds to that when they responded to that, they tried to coerce the Americans in Boston only, missing the fact, again, distance from the people, that it was all 13 colonies who were mad. And to the Americans, these intolerable acts were too far, 
And within a year, they're meeting in Philadelphia. And within a year after that, they've written the Declaration of Independence. Dun, dun, dun. So, 12 attributes. War starts the conflict. French New War, very successful. Two and a half, or not, massive debt. Weak government leadership, as I told you, five prime ministers in seven years. Tumult, just upheaval. It doesn't help also that at this very moment, the, the, the colonists are exerting strong leadership. Not just strong in that we're, we're closer, we're more powerful than you, but it's actually good leadership. One of the things I teach the students, is like why the Americans, why were they able to pull this off when you stand back and look at it, is that we have, for whatever reason, God, fate, good luck, whatever you want to go with, the most amazing constellation of leaders that except for maybe Washington, you could have gotten rid of all the top 50 that are famous in the second bench level group that were all in the various states. These are amazing. And had the women been allowed to contribute, you had this other group of amazing leaders like Abigail Adams, who's just the most famous, who were brilliant in their own right. And so you have this sense where you know the Americans have this constellation of amazing leaders, and then you've got these guys and the poor prime ministers who are struggling to kind of pull things off. They make a series of poor governing decisions, and the, 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 these three are always linked, right? So the, you can imagine, you can see it, I mean, going into too much depth. The idea of weak government leadership making poor government decisions that then leads the people to feel like the government doesn't know us. You see how those are all tied together. And so again, every time in the great crisis, this attribute kind of comes back up again. And here, the example, of course, is the Stamp Act. Now, poor Grenville, I feel sorry for Grenville, because Grenville in London tries to figure this out ahead of time. He actually pulls together the colonial representatives. You've probably been told, no taxation without representation. That, too, is American propaganda and a flat-out lie from the way, one way of looking at it, which is they had representatives in London, and Grenville asked Ben Franklin among them to say, hey, think this is a good idea? It, it works here, and we got this huge debt crisis, and by the way, the British citizens living over there, your people, you Americans, you're not paying any of your debts. You're not paying your fair share. They're paying like 170th. Imagine we found out Texas paid 170th of the tax because of President Bush was from Texas. I don't know about you, I like Texas well enough, but you mad. Hey, hey, every state, pay your income tax, pay your fair share, right? Everybody, even Stephen, right? Everybody, everybody in the 50. It's because your president's from there, I mean, you get off on that, right? But they weren't paying their fair share. And Franklin and the other representatives in London told Grenville, yeah, good, that's, that's a perfect plan. And they actually wrote their friends. We have Franklin's letter to one of his best friends. I got a great job for you. You don't have to do anything. Just hand out these stamps. Piece of cake. That guy's house got burned down. Franklin's house almost got burned down. His wife's quick thinking saved the day. In the process, what you see is there's this distance between what the people are expecting and what the government does. Active opposition. As the Stamp Act comes, the response from the people is in two folds, but they're active against the government in open rebellion. And it depends on how you want to look at it. These groups are kind of extremists, and these are just three of the most famous of these groups of people. But it's not just activists also, it's also kind of political leaders who begin to emerge. So they have a Congress that uh, 12 of the 13 states come to called the Stamp Act Congress. But more importantly, within each one of the states, there emerged um, organized groups of leaders from counties and cities that began what they called a committee of correspondence. They were writing with each other, not only to talk about their fears or try to protect each other, but also to be asking questions about what does the best civic government look like. So new political voices beginning to talk and try to organize. Explosive writing. Thomas Paine is most famous. But again, there were a series of letters. You want to fascinate yourself. Go back to the archives and read the letters of the newspapers of the variety of cities, obviously the big ones most famously, in, say, 1670. 1667 through 76. And this the brilliance and the focus and the, and the, the kind of anger and, and at the same time hope for a new, better way of thinking. Amazing. There's always this change of communication. So last time it was the pamphlets. This time it's the way that the Americans had organized their postal exchange, which allowed for news to travel up and down the seaboard within a week, which is very slow for you and me. At that time it was outstanding. And so, for instance, this is Paul Revere's masterpiece, propaganda masterpiece, because if you look at this painting, you've got the British soldiers all on a line shooting at the innocent people, and you can't see, it's very too small, but way up here there's like a sniper 
Well, actually, there were like six boys in their uniforms. They're soldiers. They knew what they were doing, just guarding the post. And there was this mob of two or 300 people throwing rocks at them, and in some cases, grabbing their weapon, pulling it at their chest, calling them, cursing, spitting at them. Not surprisingly, at some point, it went out of hand. Somebody yelled fire. You know, anybody who's ever been in the military, one of the things they develop is kind of protection of each other without needing to hear anybody else. If I heard one of my friends say, their gun went off, I'm shooting too. And smaller people were killed. And as I told you, Adams got off. But the point of that with this is that before the Crown even knew it had happened, which it took them two months before they found out, this was this painting and news of this was all of down the seaboard. The narrative was already being constructed by the Americans or by the people on one side of the philosophical divide. Okay. Last four things for this one. The economic distress. Most of the debt of the war kind of lingers over everybody. There wasn't as much debt or distress economically in the colonies themselves, but there were in England. That's kind of what's driving it. The explosive event, of course, I mentioned to you, the Boston Tea Party. These are the coercive acts. But they, we knew it as, we thought it was intolerable. They were trying to coerce us only Boston, quite honestly. But the whole 13 colonies saw this as intolerable. Boston massacres, the blood in the streets. And then here's the unforeseen trigger event, which I already told you about. Lord North's decision to lower the tax of tea, because it makes people unhappy in the process. OK, I'm going to pause there just for a second, because that's a lot. Any questions about these first two examples? We'll do the next two again. More famous as we go. I'm trying to just show you the attributes, and then I'm going to need your help in trying to figure out have we matched these attributes at our own time? You can be thinking about it already. Okay. I'm going to ask you. I'm going to let you answer. You're going to tell me. I've got my own ideas, but we're all living here now, right? So you're going to help me figure this one out. Okay. Question? Good? All right, good. Okay. Uh -huh. Whoops. Good. Civil War. Well, you know the Civil War. All right? So, oh, that's good. One, two, many. That's way too many words. But, but you know really generally what happens. It is sociologically, two things are going on. Manifest destiny and the rise of abolition. These two things begin to butt heads with Texas. You would think when Texas says, hey, let us become part of the United States, manifest destiny, we'd say, well, sure, absolutely. Free land, we'll take it. Right? But the abolition movement, because Texas was, economy was driven on slavery, said, no, 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 not so fast. So it becomes very explosive. It impacts the 1844 election. And eventually it leads us to war with Mexico. We win that war. We win it handily. And it's one of the most controversial wars. It's actually historically worse controversially than Vietnam. It's hard for us to understand because we're here now. We all know Vietnam. Most of us, we experienced Some of us lived through that. And, and so we go, oh, I can't be. No, Mexico. Mexico war was far, far worse. Um, for people. It's probably the one thing we've ever done in a country that embarrasses me from a war point of view. The weak governing leadership didn't know what to do. They thought they could solve it with what was called the Compromise of 1850. All that really did was provoke the divide. Because they offered two ideas. One, the Fugitive Slave Act, which was offensive to the abolition movement. And two, the idea of popular sovereignty, which was a bonus to manifest destiny, but it introduced the concept of democracy, which was not something our founders believed in. We don't believe in having everybody vote on all the issues all the time because it's dangerous, according to Madison and many, many others of the founders. And now in 1850, they're like, oh, we'll just let democracy happen. Well, that's dangerous because now it will get messy. And so sure enough, an unexpected decision to try to fund an, an intercontinental railroad, but that seems like a normal thing to do. It's, it's like, I want to lower the taxes on tea. Well, that makes a lot of sense. That's a good thing to do, right? Let's build a railroad. We just got California. Of course we should build a railroad. What it does, unexpectedly, is it provoked people on this issue of both popular sovereignty and abolition in the middle part of the country, leading to an open war with Kansas and Missouri. You could arguably say world, uh, the Civil War does not begin with Fort Sumter in 61, but it begins with bleeding Kansas in 55. War is fought between the Kansas and the Missourians for the whole focus of the war from 55 on. It's not a time when they're not either under threat of roving bands of soldiers kind of rolling in. This open opposition of the Fugitive Slave Act will lead to open attack by citizens against the government and the government's agents, the marshals, the sheriffs, the judges, as various and sundry slaves or free black people were depending on whose point of view you take, whose narrative, kidnapped or found, right? And then rolled through a trial to try to give some credence of, well, this is a legal event. Of course, the poor African-American person had no ability to speak on their own defense. 
And so in various places throughout the 1850s, abolitionist people basically attacked the marshals, attacked the jails. And most famously, that one I showed at the beginning of our talk happening in Ohio, the same time that Lincoln is in his debate with Douglas. And so when that happens, the, the federal government, of course, comes to arrest the, what they're called the rescuers. But the Ohio authorities arrested the sheriff and some of the federal marshals and put them in jail for kidnapping a citizen of their city of Oberlin, the black man, John Price. So now you've got this really kind of battle. And courts get involved, and basically people are saying, screw the courts, I don't care what the court says. Our system of government, of course, the government of the people, our government of law, of course, is based upon the concept that individuals within the, citizen, within the citizenry will choose to obey. Now, individuals like you and me typically have very little way to fight back, because obviously if enough police officers come, you're going to go with them, you're not going to be able to stop them. But if you can imagine this in this kind of philosophically, if you say, I no longer will obey the law, I'm not going to stop at stop signs at 2 in the morning or 2 in the afternoon. I don't freaking care. And you're willing to fight on that point, then there's no judge who can do anything about you because you've said, I will not listen to what the judge says. If that goes to the highest levels of our government, our governors, our mayors, or our president, as President Jackson and President Lincoln both did, well, then now the whole system becomes kind of fraught with danger. And the abolitionists had decided that slavery was such a great evil that any system of government that protected it was not a system of government I had to obey. And if it meant shooting you or being shot myself, I don't care. And they really got to that point. The, the explosion in Ohio led one of Ohio's native sons who had grown up 10 miles from the city of Oberlin, a man named John Brown, who had already gone out to Kansas and kidnapped some slaveholding families and executed them, chopped them up with swords, and freed their slaves, got a group of people to ride from Ohio down to Virginia to a place called Harper's Ferry, which was a federal arsenal. Many of the members of the rescuers went with him. The, two fir the first two people who were killed, one an African American, were rescuers from the John Price over the Wellington Rescue. And they thought he was captured. We, it's hard to tell with John Brown what he was thinking, but in general terms, it looks like he wanted to get captured. And so he used this moment to make his speech, and then, shockingly, he's executed by the state of Virginia. Remember, he attacked a federal arsenal. To people in the north, the execution by the Virginians was a signal that the slave power could not be stopped by any other way. They would not follow the rules. To the people of the south, the fact of John Brown coming showed them that the abolitionists didn't care what the laws were. They were going to come in and attack us, even kill us in our sleep. And so now you have this unexpected <laughs> kind of thing. And this, in his execution in November of 1859 comes the year ahead of Lincoln's election. And one month later, South Carolina votes to secede. And by January of the next year, ten, uh, six other states will go with them. Of course, you know the rest of how that story works out. So let's see the pattern. War starts the conflict, Mexican-American War. Weak governing leadership, just like the British, we had seven presidents in a 20-year window. Now, that doesn't sound that bad, but we had two deaths, just regular deaths. But then you have two people taking office who weren't really chosen by the people. Just to put it in context, from Washington to Martin Van Buren, only eight presidents. So what's that, I can't do the math fast, about 52 years? 52 years, 62 years, something like that? Eight presidents, and 20 years, seven presidents. So same kind of turnover. But Congress was equally in trouble at that point. Congress had had a, a strong leadership role with men like Henry Clay and uh, Thomas Benton, Daniel Webster. And by 1850, they were all aged or dead. Which doesn't mean the next people can't do the job, but they were young and had not had their opportunities yet. So you have a weak leadership in Congress. Arguably from the war to them, all of those were poor, but in particular the Compromise of 1850 really signaled to the people there was this distance. There was this feeling amongst the North in particular that the Fugitive Slave Act was a kowtowing down to a small group, because when you think of the plantation owners, it was a very small numerical group of people who you know, kind of ran that economy. So today we might think as some of our tech leaders there's a bunch of people in technology, but they're, you know, we all can think of the names of the small group of two dozen, 200 leaders at the top. 
And if the government was making some decision today in deference to the tech industry, they might tell us it's for our own sake because we love the internet, but we might also think more darkly that it's to help those few people. And to people in the North, that's what this looked like to them. The events in Kansas, Missouri also really showed how far they misjudged things. I think if you asked them in 1754, do you think Americans will take up arms and start shooting each other over popular sovereignty in Kansas? They would be like, oh. And yet, if you look at the story, and if you read things that are being said, even in 1850, um, no, I'm sorry, 56, um, there are open members of Congress who are saying, we will secede. In fact, one historian said Congress was a poisoned atmosphere. So this is before Lincoln. It's there, right? New political leaders, so new political voices. In the 1840, the abolitionists decide they're going to try to win the legal way. They're going to kind of copy what the Americans had done 80 years before. Right? So there were the street games of the Liberty Boys and the Sons of Liberty, but there was John Adams and the others who were writing these documents, right? the Declaration of Rights and eventually the, the Declaration of Independence. And so they wanted to try to do it the legal way. So they began a series of political parties. And from 1840 to 1860, abolition parties will be in the mix. They'll change names three times. The first time it's called the Liberty Party. They'll do three elections. Then coming out of the war with Mexico in 1848, there'll be a new group called the Free Soil Party. F-R-E, so it's an idea that the soil we took from Mexico should not have slavery, right? But by 1855, with Bleeding Kansas, they decided we needed a new name. And a group of people in the Midwest Decided, you know what we should do? We need something that's a little more catchy, that's also got a historical bent. So they reached all the way back to Jefferson, which is kind of shocking since he was a slaveholder. They reached back to Jefferson, and they took the name of his political party, which was now dormant, the Republicans, and brought it back to say, we are the new abolition party.